All right, good morning. good morning. Welcome, good to see everybody here this morning. It'll be a great week. You know, Mother's Day was last week. Uh, also, with Mother's Day being last week and then my uh, anniversary being this week, I spent a ton of money on flowers this week. So I, uh, I spent a lot more fl- money on flowers than I'd probably do all year this week with Mother's Day and the anniversary happening. But hope you all had a great week and welcome you could join us this morning. So, uh, you know, we've been plugging away, plugging through the books of the Bible, right? And if you're following along, what book are we in this week? I'm out of here. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I'm getting... Start the car. Uh, we're in Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a book we're in, right? Oh, my. Oh, here we go. We're in Nehemiah. So, um, luckily for you, these are all on the website and the internet and Facebook. Just, you can go back and you can watch them if you missed any weeks. Um, but now we are in the book of, of Nehemiah. Uh, if you haven't been here, you know, we've been working starting with Genesis all the way through. Now we're in the book of Nehemiah. And, you know, uh, this is... I think it's so important for us to do because, number one, we now hopefully have a better understanding of um, what the books of the Bible are and uh, what, what they mean. You know, that, that's super important that we do that. We got a hand in the back? We're in Nehemiah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we are in Nehemiah. We are in Nehemiah. Uh, but, you know, the purpose of doing this is so we do have a better understanding of the Bible. You know, what the books are, what, what are the purposes, what's the purpose of it? And not only what's going on in history, because we want to understand the narrative of the Bible, like what God is doing through his people, what his plans are, what's happening in the context of the books, but also what's the spiritual application, you know, because you can know a lot about the Bible, but if you don't apply it to your life spiritually, then it's going to be no use as well. It's just head knowledge. So we are in the book of Nehemiah, because honestly, as Christians, we should have some basic understanding of these books. We really should. Um, people ask us questions. Uh, I mean, it just stands to reason that you should have a little bit of knowledge about this stuff. So, starting off, like you do every week, the author of Nehemiah, well, uh, it is Ezra, tradition has it. It doesn't say it specifically, but um, it, based on the fact that, that uh, Ezra and Nehemiah were originally one book. But that is what tradition has, is the author of, of the book of Nehemiah. Uh, date period, uh, we're looking at written between 445, 420 P- B.C., somewhere in the area. And the real question, why was this book written? What is the purpose of the book of Nehemiah? Well, it's continuing the history of the Israelites out of, when they come out of captivity, out of Babylonian captivity. Israel's return some months. So they were in captivity, in exile, they're starting to return, and this is covering how they are starting to rebuild the temple. They are now going to be having the issue of rebuilding the wall around the city, and we'll talk about more of that in a second. So that's what's going on in the book. And then a few high points out of the book of Nehemiah. Um, chapter 2, Nehemiah, he begins the work on, on the wall. In chapter 8, the power of God's word when it's being read aloud. So these are some kind of high points that we find. So uh, this week... We're going to spend a little more time, maybe, than usual, actually reading some of the text, just because uh, it really helps to understand it, Um, but I hope that it really helps you better understand what we're going through. So we'll begin with chapter 1. Chapter 1, this is Nehemiah's prayer, and let's see what is happening. So chapter 1, we'll begin with verse 1 through 10. So chapter 1, 1 through 10 says this, uh, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile was in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. So stop right there, and he's, he's hearing a report of how, how, how bad things are uh, in that area. And um, he's going to, well, see how he responds. Verse 4, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And then I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. We'll stop right there. We're not going to read all through of it. Um, But just this sets the stage for what's happening in this book. So here, Nehemiah, 
Uh, he is the, you look at the very last verse, he's the cupbearer to the king, uh, meaning his, basically his job was to uh, drink the cup and, and eat the food before the king had it. That way, if anyone poisoned it, he's the one to go and the king doesn't go. Doesn't sound like a very good job. I was like, oh, you know, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but, but anyways, that's what he, where he's at. So he hears this report of how bad things are. And what's his response? We can learn from this a couple things. Number one, he has, a, he has a response of compassion. He actually feels for these people. He actually is concerned for what's going on. Uh, he, he, he mourns, he weeps, he, he fasts. Uh, he's going through all these, these, these emotions. And then what does he do? Well, then he prays, right? So, number one, he has emotion of compassion towards these people. Number two, then, he, he, he prays to God. He confesses the sins of the people, and then he's going before God. And so I think some of the couple things we can learn from here. Number one is, is as Christians, as people who are honoring God and, and, and should be honoring God, do you feel compelled to help people when they are in need? Do you have any kind of compassion towards people? Uh, do you, does your heart break for people? Uh, I mean, because again, this, I mean, it's not like this is really affecting him directly, right? But his heart was breaking for these people. And then, what did he do? He went to the Lord in prayer. Very interesting that, that that's what he's choosing to do in there. And what we're going to see in a second is, okay, sometimes we feel maybe compassion for people, or we feel... Um, uh, compelled to do something, or, or a heartbreak for people, or even pray for people. But what we're going to see in a second is, you know what? Well, what are you going to do about it? You know, I, it's, it's great that you maybe feel compassion. That's great you want to pray. But if you can do something about it, do something about it. What we're going to see is Nehemiah does something about it. He's actually going to take some action to make a difference in the situation. And so, again, as Christians, uh, are we having compassion for people who are in need? Are we praying to God about it? And then, are we going to try to do something to help and change the situation? Whatever it might be. Because you know what? If you say you care about something, and you don't actually try to do something to help and change, do you really care? Or are you just having kind of like an emotional response? But nevertheless, that's what's going on. Now, we're going to jump forward, go to chapter 2. This was where uh, Artaxerxes sends Nehemiah to Jerusalem. So chapter 2, verse 1 through 9 says this, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had not been sad in his presence, and the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will you be gone, and when shall you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make the gates and the fortress of the temples in the wall for the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked for. The good hand of God was upon me. We'll stop right there a second. Uh, and so... Uh, it's interesting here what's happening. So, okay, uh, Nehemiah is going through all his emotions, and the king notices that he's upset. And then the king asks him, oh, what, what are you asking? What can I do for you? What's, what's the first thing Nehemiah does? Before he even opens his mouth and asks, he prays. He prays to God. So what should I, my words be? When's the last time we've done this as people? Like maybe, maybe you're feeling like God is calling you to do something or maybe you're not sure if you should do something or not do something. And when's the last time you prayed to God before you did or didn't do something? Like that is a, a sound principle that we see here. You know, and I can imagine him standing before the king and it doesn't give us a lot of detail, but I'm guessing maybe he just, you know, pray silently, God, give me the words to say. What do you want me to say? What should I ask for? Um, but again, he first consults God before he goes into this, right? And so, and then what do we see? 
he makes some smart moves. Like he actually asks God or asks, asks the king for letters so he can have safe passage. He wants to get letters set up for his ships so he can get timber to build what he needs to build. And so these are great principles that we see. Like what what are the, what are some sound principles that we see that are key to Nehemiah's success? I mean, number one, he goes to God before prayer, right? And so as, as people, if we're really people of God, we should be praying and asking him things all the time. God, what do you want me to do? Is, is this your will? God, what should I say? Um, before we just spout off and do something, right? And then once we pray and then once we listen, um, are we making plans, uh, smart moves to accomplish our goal? Like Nehemiah didn't just, you know, run off and, and do whatever, he, ma- he made sure some things were in place. You're getting letters for safe passage, getting timber set up, and things like that. Which means, okay, if you have a goal or a plan in your life, are you, are you actually trying to get things, like, make smart moves? So, okay, God, what do you mean to do? Pray about it. And then, get some things set up. If you say, oh man, I really want to, like, get closer to God this year. I want to grow spiritually. I want to really get into it. Okay, that's great. How are you going to do that? What's your plan? I mean, you could say, well, you could, you could say, okay, well, I'm going to get up every day, a half an hour early, and read the Bible. I'm going to listen to these podcasts while I'm driving to work and, or driving from work. I'm to, going to get involved into this ministry. I'm going to maybe uh, uh, fast once a week, fast once a month, like whatever it might be. But you see, like, you're not going to magically wake up one day spiritually mature. you got to get some things in place to make some moves. You know what I'm saying? Or maybe you're just like, okay, God, uh, I, I, what? I'm having issues in my, in my marriage, in my relationship. Okay, that happens. What are you going to do about it? Are there some things, are smart moves you can make to try to move in the right direction? Apply godly principles to your life and apply them to your marriage, apply them to yourself? Absolutely. Um, but so, again, key principle to Nehemiah's success here. He felt a compassion. He felt compelled. He prayed to God about the situation. And then he made a plan and some steps, practical steps, to get things rolling. Jump forward to chapter 2, 11 through 16. We're not going to read all of this, but I'll read part of it. Chapter, verse 11. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, and I and a few men with me, and I told no one what God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. And there was no animal with me but that which I had rode. We'll, we'll stop um, right there. Um, and actually, let's jump down to verse 16. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. And so, again, he, um, he was being smart about it. He went there, didn't tell anybody about it, and doing some inspection, kind of checking out the wall at night and trying to make sure things were in order. But again, just smart, wise planning for Nehemiah and his success that we see all of this. Secrets to Nehemiah's success. Man, apply these to our lives. Apply, like these aren't, this isn't just a nice story to listen to. Like Good foundational principles in all of this to see success. So we're going to go forward here. Uh, chapter 3, we're going to see um, details of rebuilding the wall. We're not going to go into it too much because basically it's, it's a long list of a lot of names. And so we keep a lot of records of who worked on what, who did what, part of, of, of that kind of thing. Chapter 4, we'll jump forward is opposition to the wall. You guessed it. So, okay, now they're going to be re- rebuilding the wall because, again, in, that, in the ancient days, if you didn't have a wall around your city, you were a sitting duck. I mean, you needed some protection there. And it was a very, very key component to kind of trying to, not only for protection, but also renewal of what it means to be God's people in terms of just this, this um, city. So now we're going to go forward, go to... Chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, says this. Now when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and the enemy of Samaria, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and then burn ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and said, Yes, what they are building, the fox goes up on it. He will break down their stone wall. You can give, go to verse 7 through 9, and we won't read it, but again, they are extremely angry about them rebuilding this wall. And a couple of things you're going to see is, again, we talked about it last week. If you are going to try and do something for God, if you're going to try to make progress, 
expect opposition. You know what I mean? It's not going to be easy. It, it, there are people who are not going to want to see you succeed. There are people who are going to try to bring you down and drag you down. You know, and even in terms of your spiritual, your spiritual growth, you know, um, there might be people, oh, man, why are you going to church so much more? Why are you spending so much time in church? Why are you spending time reading the Bible? Why are you, why are you doing all that? Or there might be people that try to like, get you in a bad mood and cause a fight with you and drag you down. You know? And there'll be, there'll be challenges. There'll be opposition. But even more so, that we need to see is this, is when you start trying to do something for God, when you start trying to get spiritually closer with God, you know the spiritual realm of evil is not going to like that. You know, I know sometimes we in the West don't think much about this, but there is a real unseen realm of evil. And the Bible clearly talks about it. Jesus encounters it in terms of demonic spirits and evil and things like that he casts out. I know people firsthand that have dealt with um, demonic plus people and spiritual realm and things like that. And so the stories I could tell you would really reawaken you to the reality of this. But when you start trying to get closer to God, when you start trying to move in that direction, they're not, the evil is not going to like that. And so don't be surprised if there are things that try to uh, discourage you, that try to pull you down, that try to stop you from doing that. But keep this in mind. They, look, look what he says in verse 9. And we prayed to our God instead of guard his protection against them day and night. A couple of things we see is, so number one, opposition's happening. Um, but number two, they pray and they set a guard of protection. Now you might, wait a second here. <laughs> why, 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 the, why are you setting a guard out there if you have faith? Just, pr- just pray. I can hear people back then. Oh, just have faith. Don't set a guard out there. They did both. The biblical idea of faith, you pray, you trust God, but you can also make some smart moves. Verse 9, they prayed and they set a guard of protection against there. You see, like faith and common sense, they work together. You know, it's not like, oh, we just prayed about it and then just was silly about it and didn't think of a practical thing we could do as well. They prayed and they set a guard. And so as Christians, we can have faith, we can pray, we can trust God, and still make wise decisions. You know, we can pray, we can trust God, but when you go out in your car, it's probably still smart to wear a seatbelt. It's still smart and wise not to drink and drive. And so pray, trust God, but still make wise decisions. They go hand in hand. He did. God gave you a, a functioning brain to make smart decisions. Uh, you know, you shouldn't be just going off being careless, but we see these things. Opposition's faced, they trust God, they pray, but they still make smart decisions. They're still putting a guard out there to, to, to handle any opposition that might try to harm them. But nevertheless, move on. Chapter 5, we're going to see now Nehemiah is going to help the poor. And so what we're going to see happening here is Nehemiah chapter 5, we'll read it, uh, verses 14 through 19, says this, Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes the king, 12 years neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them their daily ration, 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded over them. But I did not do so because of the fear of God. I also preserved in the, in the work on the wall, and we acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, beside those who came to us from the nations who were around us, beyond for my good, oh my God, all that I have done for this people. Remember, for my good, oh my God, all I have done for this people. And so essentially, this is again a reminder of Nehemiah's heart for people. So essentially in that day, the governors and leaders, they were entitled to food and portions and, and um, money and things like that. And Nehemiah saw that these people were going through hard times. Uh, actually, if you read the whole chapter, they were actually selling family members and the slaves to get money to pay to live because they couldn't live. And that was a terrible thing. Nehemiah was not pleased to see that. And so one of the things that he does is out of his reverence and fear of God, uh, meaning a high reverence, high respect uh, out of God, wanting to honor him. Uh, he doesn't take those portions that he could have, and he in, instead gives the people, helps the people. And so, uh, again, a, a key thing is, if, as Christians, if we see people who are in need, and we can help, 
And we should do something about it. It's not, it's not just about how much can I gather more and more and more and more for myself while other people are struggling. It's how can I be an agent of change uh, and, and he does this for the people. And that's just kind of a, tells you a little bit about Nehemiah's heart. Chapter 7 will go on. Uh, chapter 7 is some final touches on the wall once the wall is completed. And, uh, you know, there's a long list here of some things that are happening, uh, people who returned. But I like what it says in, in verse 5, Nehemiah 7, 5. Then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogy. If you remember from even last week and week before, uh, God puts things into people's hearts. Nehemiah recognizes this compassion, this being compelled, this thing to do, that God put it in his heart. We see even prior that God moved the heart of the king of Persia right, to allow the Jews to come back. Uh, and this is one thing that we sometimes neglect. If you are compelled to do something for God, if you, if you see a need that you think needs addressed or someone needs help, I mean, this could stand to reason that maybe God's put it in your heart to do that. You know, sometimes you think, oh, it's just because I'm such a good person or I'm so wise or I'm so righteous. Uh, probably not. You know, one of the ways that God speaks to you and me is through these whispers, these nudges that we feel compelled to do through our heart. And the question is, are you in tune to that? And if you are in tune to that, then do you act on that? You see? And that's, that's a big difference here. Um, with Nehemiah and other great men and women of God, they would listen to that, their heart of, of what, what do I feel compelled to do? A situation, a person to help, to make a change. To, to serve. They would recognize that God had given them that through His Spirit, and then they would act on that. So, I think sometimes we are, just, we are missing out big time because the Holy Spirit will speak to us in this way. And so, are you listening? Uh, now, again, uh, you should read Scripture. Does it go against what God says to do? Because if it goes against that, then that's an indication that God didn't put you that in your heart to do something like that. that he wouldn't contradict his word. Uh, but also talk to people about it. Ask them about it. What do you think about this? I mean, actually, David had it in his heart to, to build a temple, but actually God says that he wasn't to build a temple. It was, he said, God said, it's good that it's in your heart, but actually Solomon's going to build the temple. Now David uh, helped and set some things up for it to be built, but nevertheless, uh, this is a key thing. Are we listening to that still small voice that God is pushing you? Because God wants to use you. God is in the business of using his people to make a change. Are you listening? And then are you acting? Uh, Nehemiah, very first chapter, he felt compelled. He prayed about it. He could have stopped there, but he didn't. He then pressed forward to get something done. TCB, taking care of business. I know that song, taking care of business. Huh? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, getting it done. You know, uh, praying about it, compelled, acting. To, to make people change in their life. To God is using him. And that's a key component as Christians. You know, so key. We'll talk more about that in a second. Go on to chapter 8. Ezra reads the law. And I find this very interesting. Because there's a lot of, lot of little nuggets in here if you, if you read. And we'll read. So Ezra chapter 8, 1 through 3, says this. And all the people gathered as one man into the, into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what was heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and all those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Chapter 8, verse 8 now. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that people understood the reading. Now verse 9 through 12. In Nehemiah who was governor, and Ezra the priest and the scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet wine and send portions to anyone who is nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites 
calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and make a great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. Boy, a lot of things. So, number one, uh, they're becoming a people of the book, a people of the Word. You know, we're going to get back into the Word. We're going to follow God. Uh, and the first part that we read, they gathered and they listened to the reading from morning till midday. And it said what? Their ears were attentive. This is a big difference, I think, that some we can't relate to. You mean, wait a second, they're sitting there like all that day listening attentive? It doesn't compute to us because we're checking our watches. You know what? It's almost noon. I got to get home. Steelers playing. I got things to do. It's a different mindset. These people are hungry for God's Word. They want more of it. I've told you a story before about the pastor I grew up with. He's from India. His wife's from India. And he still goes there from time to time to visit family. And he says, like, when I would preach there in India, people packed into a sweltering hot room. And I would preach a sermon. And they would say, no, no, more. We want more. And he's like, I'm, we, we, hear, we want you to keep preaching. Don't stop. You know, uh, I'm sensing that I'm not getting that from you here right now. You know, keep preaching. We want more. No, you're like, oh, all right, we're almost there. See, it's a different mentality. These people are hungry for the Word of God, uh, and their focus is that. And all the other little trivial things that we might be clamoring to get to, uh, it's priorities. You know what I'm saying? And, and so this, their mindset is like, you know what? Nothing is more important than being fed the Word of God, hearing the Word of God. You didn't hear, they're not sleeping. So they were attentive. They weren't thinking, man, this sermon's too long. They wanted more. That's point number one. Point number two is when he said they were there and they clearly explained to the people so they would understand. That's the thing. You know, I want you to understand. I want us to understand. That's really one of the reasons that we're doing this whole thing of going from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Because I want you to understand more of God's Word. You know, uh, it's, it's not the easiest thing to do. To start at the beginning and work all the way through. There's a lot of work, a lot of reading. Uh, and then to try to cover it, maybe it's not always the flashiest style of preaching, but I guarantee you, you're going to learn a lot more than if I just got up here and, you know, gave you a few feel-good stories and jokes and sent you on your way. Uh, and because as Christians, we should know this. I mean, like, in all the years you've listened to preachers, I mean, I, I don't know how many has ever done this, where you've gone through the entire Bible, like, in order, and he explained actually what was going on. Like, not just gave you a little moral truth of love your neighbor and be good. I'm talking about have an understanding of what this book is saying and the meaning of it, and then apply it spiritually. Because they, know, they knew the importance of... They, they, they were there to explain so people understood. You know, it's, it's amazing how many in America are biblically literate because they, they believe in God, they believe in Jesus, but they don't know anything else and they don't care to know anything else. You see the stark contrast between that mentality and the mentality that they have here. And the third point we see in the section is they sent off to rejoice. They said, hey, listen, you should be joyful. You should be celebrating. Uh, go off and, and celebrate your joy is found in the Lord, you know. Joy is not found in your bank account or even your circumstances. It is based on who God is. He made you, what He's done, and His plan for you and where things are going. But all those things, you can find that in that section if you really look. Yeah, you can read it and you can look at it from, a, okay, this happened in history to what's going on. But look at the underlying spiritual principles that we find in it as well. And that was verse uh, 9 through 12, which we'll go through. Uh, and so we see all of that. Go to chapter 9. Uh, this is in chapter they're, gonna, they're going to confess their sins. Um, they're going to realize how far they have gone against God and rebelled against God. And they realize the key to getting back on track is to repent, to turn from their sins and turn back towards God. Uh, chapter 9, 1 through 3, we'll see it. We're not going to read all of this, but essentially... Uh, they were worshiping God, they were um, repenting, they were uh, made confessions, and then go on to verses or chapter 9, 30 through 33. This is a key thing. Re read this part here. Nehemiah, I love, it. this is a prayer, but look what his mindset is. Many years, talking to God, many years you bore with them and warned them by your spirit through prophets, yet they would not give a ear. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of the people of their lands, 
Nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Verse 32, Now therefore our God, the great and mighty and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love, let not all the hardship seem little to you that has come upon us, upon our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people since the time of the king of Assyria until this day. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully, and we have acted wickedly. And I wanted to see in that section, number one, they recognize their sin. They weren't trying to just dismiss their sin. It's not a big deal. We, I, I, I fear that American Christians, many in the West anyway, we just dismiss our sin. Not a big deal. God loves us, forgives us, doesn't matter. Big mistake. Uh, it's, I mean, you can't read this and not think it's uh, not a big deal. Uh, we, should, we need to be faithful in actually being a Christ follower, right? And so they repent. They recognize that. But the second part of when you read that second part, it's interesting. Is Even all they've been through, he still recognizes that you are a God of mercy. You are a God of love. You are a God of justice and compassion. You know, sometimes people read like the Old Testament. They say, man, where's the mercy and compassion and, and stuff of God? Because uh, they see sometimes God punishing and, and dealing with judgment. But understand, their mindset, even when they're in trouble, is God is merciful. God is compassionate. Uh, it's the people who have rebelled and turned against him. And when you do that, there are consequences to that. Uh, but, but nevertheless, all of this is God has been faithful in keeping his covenant. Remember all the way back, we've been talking, this is all about God's covenant with his people to accomplish his purpose in the world. That's their mindset. And this is what's going on in, in, in chapter 9 here is they are becoming people of the book again. Time to repent. Time to get back to that. Chapter 10 we're going to see uh, the agreement of the people. Uh, we won't read through all of it, but uh, Nehemiah 10, 28 through 32, uh, we're not going to read through all this, but this is basically some of the things they're dealing with that, okay, uh, we need to make sure that uh, we're not engaging in intermarriage with other nations because what was happening, as you know, uh, when they would do that, they would then worship their pagan gods. That would be a problem, and they need to repent of that. They were told not to do that for that purpose. Uh, they, were, they were engaging some other things they shouldn't have been doing. They weren't uh, keeping the Sabbath holy as they should have been. And so this is that they're coming together to kind of make a, uh, renew the covenant, if you will, in, in this section. Chapter 11, the new residents of Jerusalem. This just kind of lists the leaders in Jerusalem, uh, lists some of the people on the outside of the cities and things like that as well. Uh, chapter 12, uh, this is the, the priests and the Levites. They're going to list the priests and the Levites here, and then they're going to dedicate the wall of Jerusalem. So Nehemiah chapter 12, 27 says this, And at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, with thanksgiving, with singing and cymbals and harps and lyres. Verse 31, Then I brought the leaders of Judah up onto the wall and appointed two great choirs, that gave thanks, verse 43, and they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women, the children also rejoiced, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. And so again, you see that getting back into celebrating, rejoicing who God is, what he has done, that that's got to be the center of your security, of your identity, of your hope, and of your joy. Not your circumstances, not your bank account, not your job, not anything else. Um, and it's easy to say. It's another thing to get it on the inside of you and actually have that be true. And then go on lastly, chapter 13, uh, Nehemiah's final reform. So essentially, Nehemiah goes away. Then he's going to come back and he finds that <laughs> they're... They, have, they, have they not learned anything? You know, there's still a lot of issues and troubles that were happening uh, and so there was something happened in terms of in God's house, it was uh, needed purified. They had not kept it uh, as they should have done it. So he actually tore the furnishings out and purified it. And that was an issue. Uh, intermarriage was an issue going on in, in all of this that they had to also address again. Uh, there was an issue where people were not keeping the Sabbath holy. There's a lot of buying and selling and things like that that were going on. 
uh, where Nehemiah at one point warned the people to stay outside of the city gates. And if they didn't, he said, and I quote, I'm going to lay hands on you. He was, he was, he was tired of it. Um, and uh, you can read that for yourself. It's, it's, it's an interesting, interesting chapter. And, but it's all about um, being faithful, uh, being faithful to, to God. Uh, and so as we read all of this, um, number one, Hopefully now you have a better framework for what this book is about and what is going on. So uh, if and when you read this book, you have a better grasp when you read it of actually the context and things like that. Number two, I hope you can uh, really see the spiritual underpinnings of all of this that are so, so key in what it means to be people who are focused and centered on God. And, and, and as we close all this up, man, what do you feel compelled towards um, are, you, are you feeling compassion for people, for circumstances? What is God stirring up in your heart? Is there something that you see a need somewhere? Because God wants to use you, but are you listening? Are you available? Do you feel that? Or then once you feel that, 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 that movement, to listen to that voice, then are you praying about it? You know, or are you spending time in prayer before you go off and try to do anything? God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? Think of Nehemiah when the king asked him, what do you need? He didn't even open his mouth before he prayed first, right? And so we need to slow our roll sometime. Before we run off and do something, God, what is your will? What should I do? What do you want me to say? Uh, and, but do it in the moment. You know, you could be out driving and say, okay, God, what do you want me to do? You could be in the circumstance, situation, in Walmart. Okay, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? Then, okay, do something, are, are there some practical steps you can take for success like Nehemiah did? Whether it's if you have a, a goal to get closer to God, whether it's something that you want to work on in your marriage or relationship, you can do some practical things to make, that, to make that go forth, right? Also, we see faith and actions together. You can still make wise decisions. They prayed to God, but they still put a soldier, a guard outside there. They were no dummies, right? You can have faith and still make wise decisions. And then when he was doing all of that, when his heart was moving towards that, he still TCB, taking care of business. You know what I mean? Like everyone here has different, different goals and, and different uh, um, uh, giftings and things. What's interesting is when he was building the wall, we didn't cover it in the opposition phrase, uh, but they, they were still so against him for building the wall. They sent people to him to try to get him to come down from the wall. And it says in the verse, we didn't cover it, but it says they actually were trying to harm him. They wanted to lure him away and harm him. And he said, tell them I cannot come down for I am doing a great work. And so when you feel discouraged, when you feel someone trying to pull you down, you know, when you, I cannot come down, I am doing a great work. You know, and we... God might be calling you to do something different than somebody else, too. That's okay. Don't try to shame people for not being engaged in maybe what he's calling you to be. I see this all the time. Maybe God's calling you into this ministry, and you want to shame all these other people for not helping you. And, and, and Okay, well, maybe God isn't calling them to help in your ministry. You see, we actually see in the New Testament there was an issue where they were trying to help these widows. And they were trying to gather money for the widows and go and, and help, which is a good cause, a good thing. And they were trying to get the guys to go and help. And the guys say, listen, um, we don't have time for that. Um, we're called to preach the gospel. We're going to preach the gospel. Here, take this group and go and do that. And so, you know, don't try to shame somebody else to maybe do something that is not their ministry. Now, don't use an excuse to do nothing. You should be doing something in some way. God wants to use you. Uh, God wants to make an impact for the world. But that's a key thing. Everyone has different giftings and talents and abilities, but keep that in mind as you go through. My hope is that we can be a people like Nehemiah, hard after God, compelled, seeks Him in prayer, uh, sets the plan, and then goes and, and takes care of business. And again, uh, one person can't do this. You know, you, you see churches that are thriving and growing. You see people who church members are doing just this. Like, there's an old mindset where ministry is just a pastor's job. Well, I mean, then you're, you're going you're to be a, a very stagnant church if that's the case. You know, That's why you see in the Bible, it's called a priesthood of all believers, the body of Christ, different gifts, different talents. When you rise up, okay, what well, I feel compelled to do in ministry area, what do I serve? And you go and, and you run with it and, and see what God will do through your life. But are you listening to that voice? And then are you acting upon that? If you do that, man, watch the blessings that will come in your life. Watch the amazing lives that you can touch, the impact you can life, and the kingdom will be advanced in ways that you can even imagine. That is the key component. Read this chapter. 
Apply the principles to your life and see what God will do. Because you cannot come down. I am doing a great work. God is calling you to do something for Him, for the kingdom, and watch what will happen. But again, are we being a people that consult God as we go forth? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day and everybody here. God, as we read this book, there's so many lessons learned. But God, but help us to be a people, first and foremost, that seek your will, that consult you. The way you do this daily, just in our interaction with people, God, what do you want me to do? What are you calling me to do? Who are you, what do you call me to say or not say? And God, let us be a people who are humbled, walking with you, that we don't just hear this word and forget it, but this is your word being proclaimed because you are a God who raises up prophets, raises up leaders, raises up all kind of people, puts things in the hearts of people to accomplish your will on earth as it is in heaven. Let us be attentive to that. Let us act on that. But if we, if we don't, we're not being faithful. God, forgive us all because we all have shortcomings. We all have failings. But God, I pray that you speak to every heart here, that we feel that compassion, feel that uh, being compelled, that we see and look for what are you putting into our hearts? We pray about it, and then we go and TCB, take care of business. We thank you and praise you, God, that your name be glorified and your kingdom advanced. And watch the blessing that will flow to this church, into our lives, into the kingdom, when your people actually do that. We pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.